Baby, we built okay, actually though, that's a crazy story. Kayla Unbian was just nine years old in 2017 when she was abducted in Chicago. Her father had just won custody of her and when he went to go pick her up from a camping trip that her and her mother was on, she was gone. Kayla's mom took her and they split and he was pretty sure that he was never gonna see her again. But then Netflix has this show called Unsolved Mysteries and they aired an episode about children that were kidnapped by their parents. At the end of the episode, they flashed this image on the screen and it is only on screen for four seconds. But then flash forward to last month, there's a person shopping in a grocery store in North Carolina and she sees this woman in the store and she's like, that's the woman from the poster. The woman in question is with a 16 year old girl. So the shopper runs to the front desk and is like, we have to call the cops right now. And they were right. The cops picked them up and they were able to reunite Kayla with her dad five years later. This goes to show that even when you're watching something really fast, your brain is still registering it and you can still use that information to potentially help someone. Remember the movie Conjuring 2? Well, what if I told you there was an actual police report? From the entire Einfield haunting, the police report was probably the most solid information that people could actually have from this entire case. Basically, if you are unfamiliar about the case, to give a little bit of a rundown, Janet Hodgson, who was 11 years old at the time, was allegedly possessed by a demon. After many nights of torture, the family broke down and finally called police. After visiting the house, police officer Caroline Heaps had actually signed a document stating that she witnessed an armchair levitate and float across the room. What's crazy is after this report, there were 30 more witnesses to testify that the same thing happened as well. I know this haunting is controversial where some people believe it's real, some do not, but let me know what you guys think. Scary facts I bet you didn't know. In the original Little Red Riding Hood story, the wolf forced her to eat her grandma. After Katrina McGaw watched a true crime documentary about a serial killer who used his basement as a torture dungeon, she found out she was living in the same house. And her landlord was the serial killer's mother, who didn't mention the bodies that her son kept in the basement before he was arrested in 2002. In ancient times, people used cut off human skulls as cups to drink out of. An AI robot named Sophia was declared the first robot citizen, having gained legitimate citizenship in Saudi Arabia. But when a journalist asked the robot, will you destroy humans, please say no, the robot replied, I will destroy humans. Follow for more. Imagine spending 25 years of your life in prison for a crime you didn't commit. Well, that's exactly what happened to this man here, Michael Morton. Now this story takes us to Austin, Texas in 1986. And that's where we meet Michael Morton, his wife Christine, and their son Eric. And according to Michael, by all accounts, they were a happy, loving family. Then on August 12th, 1986, everything changed. So on that specific day, it happened to be Michael's birthday, and him, his wife, and his son all had gone out to a restaurant to celebrate. Everything went well, and the family returned back to their home. The next morning, when Michael was getting ready to work, he decided to leave a note to his wife. And in the note, he made sure to tell his wife how much he loved her. But he also mentioned that he was disappointed that the two were not intimate the night before to celebrate his birthday. Little did Michael know that this note would be the reason he would spend the next 25 years in prison. And so with that, Michael left the note for Christine to read and left the house around 5.30 in the morning. Both Christine and Eric were sound asleep when he left. When Michael returned home from work that afternoon, he was absolutely horrified to see the cops at his home. The entire area had been cornered off with yellow tape and police officers were everywhere. And that's when police told him that his wife Christine had been beaten until she passed away, but thankfully their son Eric had been untouched. Now during the initial investigations, officers determined that Christine had been beaten with a wooden object, and they also discovered male DNA. But unfortunately, at the time, DNA testing was not available. But on top of all of that, police also found the note that Michael had written to his wife earlier that day, which unfortunately did not cast him in the best light. On top of the fact that it was reported that Michael arrived about 30 minutes late to work, he then became their number one suspect. Police then tried to question Eric, who was only three at the time, and he said that a monster had attacked his mother and that his father was not home and neighbors also reported seeing a strange van parked nearby multiple times with the man getting out and going into the woods. And even though there was absolutely zero evidence pointing towards Michael, the police still decided to arrest him and charge him with the crime. And then a few days later, a bloody bandana was found just near the house. But at the time, police didn't really pay any attention to it due to a lack of DNA testing. And then during trial, the prosecution omitted some very important evidence 
and it was led by this man here, Ken Anderson. He failed to tell everyone that Christine's credit card had been used at a store in Austin after Michael was arrested. But regardless, he was able to convince everyone that Michael had taken his wife's life that night for refusing to sleep with him. And then Michael was sentenced to 25 years in prison. And of course, Michael tried to overturn this ruling as much as he could. Sorry guys, I'm gonna need to do a part two. Do y'all remember back in 2009 when this young woman got her face tattooed with 56 stars and tried to cover it up by telling one of the most outrageous lies I have ever heard. Welcome back, Chicamers. That was a mouthful. <laughs> this is the case of Kimberly Valmanac. Your discretion is advised. So, like I said, back in 2009, Kimberly came up with this very brilliant idea of getting 56 star tattoos on her face. No biggie, no problem. So she went ahead, went to a tattoo artist that she secured, and got her 56 star tattoos. Now, after she was done getting the tattoos, she panicked. She saw what it looked like, she wasn't expecting it, and some people even started calling her, quote, a freak. She was like, wow, I have to do something. I don't know what to do. Let me just do the normal thing, make up a lie, lie my way out of this one. So Kimberly proceeded to go to several news outlets and say that she had, quote, fallen asleep while getting tattooed. And the tattoo artist basically took advantage of her by tattooing on more stars than she agreed to in the first place. And he simply did it because she was sleeping. My initial thought there was who falls asleep during a tattoo? I myself have a tattoo. I mean, it's not like so, so painful, but it's definitely painful and you can definitely feel it. I don't really see anybody falling asleep during that, especially a tattoo on the face. I don't know. But in any event, that was the story she decided to run with, and she even tried to sue the tattoo artist and tattoo parlor, claiming that this was all their fault and that she didn't consent. Now, initially, people believed her. Um, they were actually kind of supportive of her, but eventually she would come out and say she was flat lying. And the reason she lied is because she didn't want to look like a freak. She was worried people were going to judge her, say she was crazy, and just didn't want to associate with her. So she tried to lie her way out of it, but that ended up backfiring. Now, after all the hustle and bustle died down from that, Kimberly began some very painful and very expensive laser treatments. It took her over three years and nine laser treatments, and she was able to go back to basically normal. Here's a picture of the before with all the tattoos and a picture of after, and she's looking pretty great. She's looking just like how she looked before she got the tattoos. My dad's friend Jeffrey was Dahmer. killed by Jeffrey Dahmer. Really? Because I'm from Milwaukee, and my dad is like, like 40 something so like around that time he was in high school explain the story how, how did that go he was asian and he was not gay wait did jeffrey dahmer kill asians no no that was just like not really oh okay <laughs> into the story. did he eat your dad's friend probably what's your dad's friend's name you know it's something like send us some phone about what happened to George Torres and how his girlfriend trapped him inside the suitcase. George Torres was born on February 13th, 1978 to his parents George and Blanca, a couple of brothers and he was really close to his family. His mother Blanca says that her son was not perfect. I mean, no one is perfect, but she says that her son did make mistakes and you know, he did do things in life that he regretted. Despite him not being a perfect person, he was still a good son and a lot of people loved him. He had three children and right before his death, he was working at a local hardware store and he was really passionate about this job. In 2017, George met a woman named Sarah Boone. Two of them met at a bar where they were playing some pool, they hit it off, and then about a year later, they decided to move in together. Now, Sarah is an interesting person. She was born on October 10th, 1977, and just like George, she had previously been married and she also had a child. Sarah's ex-husband is named Brian, and he has come out and spoken about how his relationship was with Sarah. And he says that Sarah was absolutely nuts. She was an alcoholic, and she would go out every single night to different clubs and bars, and she wouldn't come home until 4 o'clock in the morning. 
She would be doing all of this on school nights while their son was sleeping. She would always choose alcohol before her family, so Brian had enough and he decided to divorce Sarah. He ended up just moving down the street from his house and they would share custody of their son. Now, when Sarah and George started dating, Brian says that their relationship was not good. He would often have to go to Sarah's apartment to go drop off their son, and anytime he would go there, he would try to avoid Sarah and George because they were always fighting. At one point, Sarah had George arrested around five to six times for domestic violence, and then another time, both of them were arrested. They kind of had a reoccurring cycle where they would get drunk, they would fight, they would get really toxic. Sarah would call the police, have George arrested, bail him out the next day, and then they would just repeat the cycle. The one time that Sarah and George were both arrested was because they allegedly went to a bar and a man was speaking to Sarah, which made George jealous. When they got to the house, Sarah says that George started dragging her up the stairs and then he punched her in the face. So police were called to the scene, but George had a different story. He says that he wasn't the aggressor, that Sarah was the aggressor, and that she was trying to strangle him and that the only way she could stop her from doing this was by kicking her. If he hadn't kicked her, then he says that Sarah would have incapacitated him. That's how hard she was strangling him. The police got into determine who was the main aggressor and they ended up arresting both of them. However, the charges against each of them were later dropped because neither one of them wanted to pursue it any further. As you can see, they were both just toxic and this relationship was not good. Everyone around them said that something bad was bound to happen. February 23rd, 2020, Sarah and George were at their apartment having what they called a good day. They were drinking some wine on the back porch, they had some cigarettes, they did a puzzle together, they painted, and then they decided to play a game of hide and seek. Sarah says that George thought it would be funny if he got inside the suitcase and hid from her. Sarah helped George get inside the suitcase. She zipped it up, not all the way. Says that she left a little hole open so that he could stick his fingers in there and unzip himself. Then afterwards, she just went to bed. She figured that he would later unzip himself from the suitcase and then join her. However, the next morning when she woke up, she realized that George was still inside the suitcase and that he wasn't breathing. Okay, go to part two. Mm -mm. This is Yosemite's Half Dome hike. It gains 4,500 feet in elevation and it is 14 to 16 miles round trip. Since 2015, 20 people have died here, and also since 2015, there have been 300 accidents. One of the most common ways to summit the Half Dome is through these cables, and Yosemite offers 250 passes per day, per season, or there is the lottery, which is 50 passes. The reason they started doing the passes and permits is to limit the accidents that happen here, but since they've started it, the numbers have not gone down. This is Danielle Burnett. In 2019, she decided to hike the Half Dome cables when it began to drizzle. I'm going to read what a witness shared. She wasn't outside of the cables, but she was 30 feet above us. We heard a commotion. She started to freak out. It had started to sprinkle. She decided to turn around before making it to the top. Her group of three or four others continued on. I saw her slip on the rock. It wasn't that wet yet, so maybe she had poorly chosen a pair of shoes. Regardless, I watched her slip on the rock and fall hard. She had lost her grip on the cable. She started sliding down to the right of the cables. My friend got down on her stomach and tried to grab her, but she kept sliding past. I stretched out and tried to grab her with my right hand, but by now she was probably 10 feet away from the cables and slid past me too. We watched as she screamed and went over the edge. She fell about 500 feet and you could still see her from the top of the subdome. Everyone was evacuated so the helicopter could fly in. She was found deceased on arrival. It's no wonder that this is considered one of the most dangerous hikes in America. And I'm an avid hiker and I love hiking, but I think I'm good on this one. All right, Mr. Murdo, I sentence you to the State Department of Corrections on each of the murder indictments in the murder of your wife, Maggie Murdo, I sentence you for the term of the rest of your natural life for the murder of Paul Murdo, whom you probably love so much. I sentence you to prison for murdering him for the rest of your natural life. Those sentences will run consecutive under the statute involving possession of a weapon during a violent crime. There is no sentence where life, a life sentence is imposed on other indictments. That is the sentence of the court, and you are remanded to the State Department of 
corrections. And officers may carry forth on the imposition. This case literally made me sick to my stomach. In South Africa in 1994, a woman narrowly survived being attacked by two men and they were just granted parole. 27-year-old Alison Botha had just parked her car near her house when a man forced his way into the driver's side. He had a knife and said he'd kill her if she tried to fight back and that he just needed the car. She told him that she wouldn't tell anyone if he just dropped her off, but when he said no, she realized that he wanted more than just the car. And when he stopped and picked up another man, Allison said she knew that her life was over. And the two men took her to a secluded area and violated her. And to ensure she wouldn't tell, they proceeded to stab Allison 30 times in the stomach and slit her throat. As she lay there, one of the men asked the other if they thought she was dead, and he said no one can survive that. But Allison did. After they left, she was clinging to life and she even wrote the names that they called each other down in the sand for police to find in case that she died. Eventually, she gathered the strength to stand up, but her head fell back because all the muscles in her throat had been cut. She also couldn't scream for help because her vocal cords had been slashed. She then started to walk towards the closest road, literally holding her head on, and she also had to hold her stomach to keep her organs from falling out. Luckily, a veterinary student driving by did stop and he knew enough about the human body to help her. And after this, he actually decided to go into human medicine and was one of the doctors who delivered her second child. It was a miracle that Allison survived and despite her gruesome injuries, she went on to make a full recovery and even had children. Back from the edge of death, she was telling police what happened to her just 12 hours after the attack. Police gave her a photo lineup of convicted violators in the area, and what do you know, both men were on there. Her perpetrators were Franz de Troyes and TMs Kruger, I probably butchered those names, and they both had a history of committing crimes against women. In court, all of their known survivors came and testified, and the duo received life sentences. On July 4th, 2023, South African courts granted both men parole. Despite expressing zero remorse, the men will now be under strict parole guidelines and they can walk freely, but they will be supervised for the rest of their natural lives. Allison was obviously extremely disappointed and disturbed by this decision. This was called one of the most horrific crimes in South African history and she wasn't even their only victim. She took to social media to write, the day I hoped and prayed would never come. When I was asked, how will you feel if they ever get parole? My immediate answer was always, I'm hoping I'll never find out. But today I do. If you live in South Africa, don't forget these faces and follow for more true crime. The Long Island serial killer has finally allegedly been caught. Almost 13 years after he murdered four women on Long Island, New York. The Long Island Serial Killer or Lisk case is a case that's haunted people for years. And it really was launched in 2010 when four women's bodies were discovered in Long Island, New York. Four women who would be known as the Gilgo Four. These four women, Melissa, Marine, Megan, and Amber, were all sex workers in the New York City area. And they had all at the time of their disappearances seemingly vanished from the face of the earth. All four of their bodies though were eventually found on Gilgo Beach in Long Island, New York. Now, these disappearances took place over a number of years. The earliest was in 2007 and the last was in 2010. But in total, there have actually been seven bodies found in that area that people think may be linked to the same serial killer, including the unidentified remains of a toddler who was 16 to 24 months in age. And the sad thing about this is that that toddler was actually the daughter of another victim. This was confirmed through DNA and the remains that were found, which means that most likely the killer murdered both of them at the same time. So for years, the Lisk case was a huge case and nobody had any concrete leads. There was no DNA evidence. There were no surveillance videos. There was really nothing. That is until just recently, I mean today, when this guy was arrested. Rex Hewerman, a 59-year-old architect who worked in Manhattan but lived very close to Gilgo Beach. Rex, interestingly enough, is a family man. He's married, he has two kids, and he works in a powerful position at the architecture firm that he's employed with. Authorities had been searching for a link between Hewerman and the Gilgo Four for a long time, but finally, just recently, they got a break when they recovered this pizza box from a garbage can. And when they tested some of the DNA that was found on this pizza box pictured here, it was almost a perfect match to the DNA found on the hair of victim Megan Waterman. At this point, though, there are a lot of things that allegedly link Rex to this case. For example, cell phone bills show that he met with three of the victims before they went missing. Records from a burner cell phone that he was using also show that Rex placed menacing phone calls to the relative of Melissa Bartholomew, who was a victim of his. 
He also had a fake profile on Tinder and he extensively contacted massage parlors and different escort services trying to arrange these sexual liaisons. Now what's interesting and that I don't see a lot of people talking about on here is that his wife's DNA has also been connected to the murders. Apparently authorities collected a water bottle from outside of the Hewerman home and his wife's DNA was a match to a piece of female hair that they found on tape that was used to bind two of the victims and it was also a match to DNA that was found on a belt that was used to tie up a victim's feet. One of his phones also was linked to tons of disturbing searches. I'm talking about CP, I'm talking about assault uh, material, watching videos of women who were tied up with bruised faces, all this horrific stuff. And the cell phone also conducted tons of searches about the Long Island serial killer, why they hadn't caught him yet, and all other sorts of weird things that tie into the case. So what do you think? Is this Lisk? Let me know in the comments below and I'll keep you updated as soon as we find out more. This is probably one of the top horrific cases I have ever covered. Please heed to the trigger warnings in this one. It is very graphic. It's the Junko Furuta case, also known as the 44 Days in Hell. Junko was a high school student who was said to not participate in the party scene. She didn't drink or do any drugs. She did get pretty decent grades and she also had a part-time job. Along with that, she had planned to have another job after she graduated. This deemed her as uncool to some of the other kids in her school, but there was one boy in particular who had a crush on her. His name was Hiroshi and he didn't necessarily want a relationship. He just liked her and wanted to take her out, but she respectfully told him no. And he was one that was known to always get his way because honestly, people were afraid of him. It was very well known by everybody that he had strong ties to the Yakuza, which essentially is a gang slash organized crime. So when Junko told him politely no, she didn't want to go out with him, he of course didn't like that. On November 25th, 1988, Junko was leaving a shift from her job and she was biking home. Wouldn't you know, Hiroshi and his friend Sinji were in the area. He had told Sinji to run up and essentially attack her while she was on her bike, kicking her down, and then flee the scene. This is when Hiroshi swooped in and said he would walk her home and help her out. Instead of taking her home, he led her to an abandoned warehouse where he let her know about these connections that he had with the gang, and he raped her. He had also threatened to kill her at this time, and after this, he went to a hotel where she was raped multiple times. At about 3 a.m., the two would link up with Hiroshi's other friends, Sinji, who was there prior, Joe and Yasushi as well. They found Junko's address in her backpack and said if she didn't cooperate, he would use his connections to have her and her family killed. After the threat, the five of them went to Hiroshi's house and it had been a couple days since anybody had seen Junko. Her parents had contacted authorities and put in a missing persons report. Once word got around that Junko was being searched for, the boys threatened her again and said that she needed to call her parents and tell them that she had run away, she was safe, she was okay, but she wanted to be left alone. Her parents did answer, they chatted, and they accepted this. Now, if you're like me, you're probably wondering, where is Hiroshi's parents? What did they have to say about all this? Well, at first they said that since she was told to act like a girlfriend, they didn't think anything of it. But later it comes out that they were actually scared of their son. And over the next 40 days, Junko would go through the most horrific torture ever. And just again, another trigger warning for you because it's gonna get rough. Not only were the four boys that I mentioned earlier involved in this, they would invite friends over as well. Over the course of her captivity, some of the things that she endured was being raped every single day that she was in captivity. It was reported to be over a hundred men had raped her. She was beaten numerous times with golf clubs, other things. They would jump on her head while she was on the concrete floor, force her to put things inside of her, such as scissors, a light bulb, roasting needles, and more. And because of this, she was unable to control her bladder or when she went to the bathroom. She was forced to eat roaches and drink her own urine. They would burn her with multiple different things from cigarettes to candle wax, also throw lighter fluid on her and set her on fire. They would forcefully pierce her nipples and rip off the left one with a pair of pliers. And there is a long laundry list of horrific things that she went through besides what I've told you. Well, one day in that December, there was one of the kids that was over there that realized how horrific these things were. So he actually ended up telling the police. They went over there, knocked on the door, and and Hiroshi's parents are the ones who answered and said, no, there's no girl here. Would you like to come in? You can take a look. Police took this as them being innocent and said, no, not necessary and left. And as we move into January of 1989 now, she had been so severely hurt that she was just unrecognizable. And the four that were doing all of this to her decided she wasn't attractive anymore. So they went out and raped another girl. And on January 4th, 1989, there was a Mahjong game that Junko played. Junko had beat the boys at the game. So they thought this was a valid reason to beat and torture her some more. They kicked and punched her. They beat her with an iron barbell, burnt her eyes with hot wax, 
and then took bamboo sticks and beat her feet with them. There was blood everywhere, and again, they doused her in gasoline and set her face on fire. She started convulsing from the pain and eventually stopped moving. They thought she had just passed out because this has happened in the past month, but in reality, she had died from her wounds. 24 hours later, they realized that she wasn't unconscious, but she had actually died. So Hiroshi called his older brother to have him help with moving the body. They would wrap her body in blankets and put her in a travel bag. Then they put her in a 55 gallon drum and they filled it with wet concrete so that way it would set all around her. After this, they disposed of her body. And of course, at this time, nobody was looking for Junko because they thought she had just ran away. Flash forward to January 23rd, Joe and Hiroshi had been arrested for the attack that they had done to the 19 year old prior. Cops had separated the two because there had been a double murder in the area that had a lot of the same characteristics, but just low key so you guys know, they were not the ones who did that. But while they were talking, police made it sound like that they knew about a murder and things like that without giving away too much information. Roshi had been under the impression that Joe had confessed to Junko's murder. So in turn, it actually ended up being a good thing because he just word vomited everything that happened they would lead authorities to her body. And of course, all of them took plea deals. Now, all of them tried to appeal their sentencing, but when this was revisited, because their reasoning was the punishment was too harsh for their crime, they actually got more time, which honestly, all of their sentencings were not very long, sadly. Hiroshi's was the longest, and he originally was 17 years, but after he tried to do the appeal, they upped it to 20. They also ordered Hiroshi's family to pay out a settlement to Junko's family. 